Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> and before we pray, I want to remind you of something, this, especially if you're, you're here this morning and you've missed several um, weeks. Uh, I want to make sure you get the, the, the context here of what Jesus is doing here. There's a difference between a law, a rule, a commandment, and a response of grace a response, uh, an action, a, a service of grace. There's a big difference. And so Jesus made sure that we understood this in verse 17 of chapter 5, where he says, uh, Do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. But to fulfill. And so um, sometimes as young believers, believers who haven't really read the word or, or, or really took the time to understand the law and grace, uh, they know that there's commandments, there's rules. And so they, they have a tendency of living their lives by rules. And so Jesus is saying, look, the laws, the rules, I've done away with that. You're no longer under laws and rules. You're now under grace. And there's a big difference because now grace comes in. And so now you have not rules, but actions of love for God. And those actions of love are a response to his love. And those are actions of grace of grace. In other words, l let me explain it this way. We all live in a family. We have a mother, a father, and we have chores that we need to do. They call them chores. You have to make your bed. You know, you have to clean the sink, wash dishes, take out the trash. Well, if you can somehow explain that those should be acts of love and not acts of law, it would go a lot easier for them doing the work if they understood it was an acts of, act of grace. Law is... You better do it. Otherwise, you will be punished. And if you don't do it, there's no allowance and, you know, that whole thing. And, of course, they're like, mm -hmm, you know, and they get grummy. And they, they don't do it. They'd rather take the punishment of breaking the law. Or if they understand that mom and dad love me, and I really do love them. You know, I write those little love you cards on Mother's Day and Father's Day, and I really do love them. And I know they do a lot for us. And they take care of us. And so I want to do something for them. And so I'm going to commit to taking out the trash. I might not do it all the time, but I'm going to really try to do it as much as I can. That's an act of love. That's where Jesus wants us to live as Christians, under the grace of God and serving him by grace. Hopefully that makes sense to you as we get into uh, these um, <clears throat> verses here that I'll try to expound on. So let's pray. Father, we come before you now. And Lord, we ask, Father, we need, Lord, the Holy Spirit to be our teacher this morning, Lord. We need him to give us clarity and understanding uh, to the word of God, Lord. Because we can take these words of Jesus and, and totally uh, misunderstand them and apply them to our lives as laws. And they're not, Lord. Uh, and they're actually actions of a changed heart. Actions of a new creature. Actions of grace. And so help us to understand that and see that, Lord. And, and fall more deeply in love with Jesus, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Hmm. Even the babies cry out to you, Lord. And let our hearts cry out to you, Lord, that we do love you. And we want your love to just be poured upon us, Father. And we want our lives, Lord, to reflect that love, that others would see it, Lord, and would desire a relationship with Jesus, too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, <clears throat> amen. I was thinking about this message after the first service and how I felt I blew it big time. And so if I was under a law, I probably wouldn't be up here the second time. But I'm glad I'm under grace and God has forgiven me. So I'm going to start a little differently. I'm going I'm to talk about how God wants us to go beyond, go beyond what is normal to reach beyond that. And so I looked up a couple of quotes. Here is the simple but powerful rule. Always give people more than they expect to get. Always give people more than they expect to get. I, I like this one too. Give the world the best you have and the best will come back to you. I hate the giving of the hand unless the whole man accompanies, accompanies it. 
The man who does more than he is paid for will soon be paid for more than he does. I like that one a lot. So if you do more than what is expected of you, uh, they'll recognize that you go beyond and, and they'll recognize they have a good employee and they'll reward that employer or employee. Always render more and better service than is expected of you, no matter what your task may be. I really like that one. And I think that fits here exactly what Jesus is saying. Always render more and better service than is expected of you, no matter what your task may be. Always render more and better service than is expected of you, no matter what your task may be. This morning, we continue on with defending marriage. Uh, <clears throat> I think all these truths apply to our relationship with our spouse, but also applies to us as Christians and to us in the world. And so we can take it anyway, but since we've started on defending marriage, uh, I'm going to keep that theme because I think that it's important that uh, we understand that humility is always helpful in our relationships with one another. If we can be humble, if one person can be humble in your marriage relationship, the, the marriage relationship can really work. Boy, if two can be humble, uh, you'll have a powerful relationship, a powerful relationship. Um, I've kind of parentheses put politeness in, in a sense because we've lost that today, right? We've lost this sense of being polite people. Uh, we're not polite people anymore. How often do you see someone who's entering into a store open the door for you and say, oh, go in after me? That's rare. Uh, we go in first and let the door slam on them as their face is hitting the door. You know, just, it's just a rare thing to see all the time because we're not used to being polite. How many times do we wait in line and we see grumpy people? Come on! You know? And they get upset when people start cutting in the line and then the swearing and the cussing and the brawling and the fighting you know, happen and grandpa and grandma are on the ground wrestling. You know, it's just we've lost that politeness. Um, I've seen it happen, I'm telling you, it happens. Uh, defining the word politeness, showing good manners towards others, as in behavior, speech, actions, uh, courteous, just being courteous as I mentioned. So even our speech and being polite. I remember there was a day when, when parents used to tell their children, when you address an adult, you say, yes, sir, no, sir. You don't even call them by name. You know, Mr. Gonzalez, that's how you address them, because of the respect. But we've lost that, because we've become so liberal, and we don't like commandments. Uh, we, we don't like rules, and so we rebel against those things, and, and we really lost the very nature of Christ, I believe. Uh, so, even in civil, uh, having polite replies uh, to parents and individuals. Civility, civility another aspect of it. This is all the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't do this without the Lord. To do it in our own flesh will fail. But to have the Holy Spirit give us an understanding of God's grace and mercies towards us, what He has accomplished for us and done for us, just like that last song that, that they just sang, which I thought was just so, so appropriate for today's message also, where that verse, and I'm trying to get to it, uh, you, you do all things well, speaking of God, just look at our lives. So the evidence of God doing something wonderful is our lives. Our lives reflect that work. question is, where's your life at right now? And how is it reflecting, reflected God? More and more, we see our younger generation losing a connection to the church. Church is no longer a vital part of their life. Church is no longer needed. And so they believe that they can be Christians without church. I don't need to go to church. Church doesn't have to be an active part of my life. And they're missing out on what God has commanded us to do, this principle of grace of fellowshipping one with another of being involved in church and of serving and of going the extra mile. And they lose all those things. 
And sometimes parents are responsible because they set the pace, they set the example, and unfortunately their kids will follow their examples. And then the repercussions of that. And what we need to do is really define what church is. Because church can be very legalistic. We can have rules and regulations, and I don't want rules and regulations here. I don't think God does. You know, I want to serve God because I love Him. And I want you to serve God because you love Him. And no other reason but that. And, and when you can have a, a heart, I thought of this picture, a rock sitting out in the boonies, wherever it is, is a rock. It's just living life. Not very exciting, right? What are you doing today? Sitting here. What about tomorrow? Sitting here. What about 100 years from now? I've been sitting here, not doing much. But imagine a rock that has been hit by lightning, that is moved by something more powerful than it. You know, what are you doing today? I don't know, but I just got hit by lightning, and it moved me all over the place. I mean, I literally broke up in pieces, and I'm just shattered all over the place. I've actually done something today. You know, That's the life that Jesus wants from us, not to just exist. Because these kids, the younger generation, I don't need church, so what are they doing? They're just existing. They're living like the rest of the world. They're not really making an impact for God. So we're going to talk about those things and, and how much of an impact should we make. And, and you're going to be challenged and surprised at what Jesus says here. So let's go ahead and read the text. Verse 38 to 42. Uh, Jesus again is speaking. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil one person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your coat also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Now, the remaining of this chapter is dealing with humility. Definitely humility, because it takes humility and a lack of pride to, to do some of these things that Jesus is asking us to do here. And definitely about love. You have to have a heart of love in order to turn the other cheek. In order to not just give someone your, your undergarment, but also give them your coat. And if they ask you for something, that you give them what they've asked. And then you even go beyond that and give them even more. That takes humility. And a lack of pride. This is an area where we as, as Christians need to go beyond the call of duty. Beyond the call of duty. It's what Jesus is asking us to do in our service with him. The complacency and the inadequacy and the contentment that we have of just being where we are and not doing much more has to stop in order to be an impact in the world around us. We have a natural tendency to not do anything. And that becomes sin to us. We need to be careful. So Jesus starts off here in verse 38. You have heard that it was said. And again, he goes back to the Old Testament. What were they saying before? They were saying an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus took an Old Testament law that was given to the judges in them making judgment calls upon certain situations that was taking place with the children of Israel. And so if the children of Israel brought to you a complaint against the neighbor, a lawsuit, the judges were basically to be fair. Look, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. If somebody steals a tricycle, don't go hang them. <laughs> that's, just, that's just not right. The right thing to do is to be fair. An eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth. Tricycle was, was taken. Make them pay for the tricycle. Or buy them a tricycle back. Uh, and then maybe even buy them two tricycles. Make that be the punishment. So the punishment was not to be extreme. If they pluck the tooth, then you know, pluck the guy's tooth out and give it back to him. Make sure it's got a little gold on it. 
So the point was, is that the law said, be fair as the judges in civil courts made those decisions. So Jesus says, that's what they said. That's how they ran things according to the law. And you find this in Exodus chapter 21, uh, verse 23 says, but if harm follows, then you shall give life for life, tooth for tooth, eye for eye, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And so whatever is fair. Leviticus 24, 19, uh, it basically says, look, if you cause a man to be disfigured, uh, so shall it be done to him. So fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and so forth. Now what was going on is that the religious leaders were taking this law that was to be given to the government aspect, the civil uh, society of the time, and they were bringing it down to the people themselves, and they were then using it as a, a burden upon them. And so Jesus says, but I tell you. Now he doesn't say, I tell you something to lessen the burden. He says, I'm going to tell you something that's going to kind of increase it where your heart really should be. It says, I tell you not to resist an evil person. Verse 39. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, and he's giving us this illustration, this example, turn the other to him also. Now that's extreme. Someone comes up and bam! What's the first thing you want to do? Bam! I saw this little video. It was an old grandpa. And this young guy comes up and you can see him hassling him. You know, like, I want your money. And there's no audio to it. And so the guy's following him, wouldn't let him move. And the grandpa's just kind of trying to walk around. And another guy comes along. And then another guy, and there's four guys surrounding this guy. And they're obviously going to take his money. Then finally the young guy went to push him. And grandpa goes, boom. The guy goes, hits the ground. The other guy comes in and he swings. Grandpa misses a swing and Boom! Hits the ground. The other two are just standing there in shock. So he walks around. And he's talking to the young guys. You know, it turns out he was an ex-boxer. <laughs> ex-boxer. That's our tendency, right? Is to just boom. Just said no. Don't do that. What did Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Right. Well, he let them hit him in the face. And then he turned the other cheek and let them put a sack over his head and then let them hit him in the face again. And, and then didn't say anything and then let him hit him in the face again. And even mock him saying, hey, if you're God and you know everything, and they're mocking him saying this, if you know everything, then tell us who hit you and bam. And then put a crown of thorns on his head and yet he said nothing like a, a lamb to the slaughter as the Bible says. So what would Jesus do? Is that what Jesus is asking us to do? Yeah. I wish Jesus would have given us some commentary here, right? You know, in what situation and when and how much? I had someone at the first service ask me, well, how many times do we let them hit us in the face? I mean, doom, 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 you know, how many times? Seven times 70? Do we just keep letting them do it and so forth? I don't think Jesus is literally talking about getting smacked in the face here. I think he's about talking about evil being done to us. It may involve being smacked in the face. It, can, it may be involved other things. But I think he's talking about private retaliation. He's talking about revenge. He's talking about trying to get back at them. And that's what he doesn't want us to do. To have a heart to get revenge. And, and you look at Jesus and you realize he didn't have a heart of revenge. He had a heart of forgiveness even on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And the Lord forgave them. He paid the penalty of their sin on the cross. We can't live life wanting to get back at people. Wanting to hurt people. We shouldn't be people of revenge, of spite, and of hate. Uh, he mentioned that earlier in, in, in the Mount there in chapter 5. Not to have hatred in our hearts. And we can have the tendency to want to get back. Even, even if somebody has harmed us or we think that they've harmed us and it's really all in our head. And so we're looking for the right opportunity to get back at them. Had a boss that, that would quite often tell us, and he made it very clear, I don't get angry. I get revenge. And he really did. He looked for opportunities to, to get you in trouble. And if you broke any rule, uh, he was on you like that because... 
you have hurt him. And so Jesus is talking about not repaying evil with evil. Martin Luther, I think, understood that. Uh, Gandhi understood that. If we could somehow, somehow display a, a love and humility to those that are evil, that maybe it could change them, it could change society. It definitely would change us completely. Not easy to do. Very difficult to do. Nor am I saying, and I have to be careful here, am I saying that if you're in a relationship like that, you should stay in it. I don't think so. I think you need to protect yourself from an abusive relationship like that. That's not what he's talking about either. Just in case you're thinking of that. That's coming to an end of yourself. And then he gives us another example. And he says, if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Now the cloak was the outer coat of an individual. The tunic was that piece that went around your head. And of course they had the inner garments and so forth. They had the girl that went around them and they girded themselves when they would run and so forth. But that outside was the most valuable part. It was used for a lot of reasons. It carried their money. It carried uh, their grain if they were carrying grain and shopping and so forth. It would keep them warm at night. Uh, in fact, Leviticus talks about if that's uh, used as a pledge to gain some resource or, or help, that that person need to give you back your coat at the end of the day because it gets cold. And, and God says, look, and I am a God of grace, and I'll remember that if you don't give them back their, their coat. And we see Jesus here saying, look, if they take your tunic, and, and the word take there means by force, literally come and sue you and take it from you, then you give them your coat also. That's a lack of pride. That's humility. That's going beyond the call than what is normal. And we've, we've lost that completely. Then he gives a third example. And whoever compels you to go one mile... Go with him too. A, a mile was a Roman mile, about a thousand paces. Legally, they had a right to ask you to go a mile and carry all of their equipment with them. That was their legal right to ask, and it was your responsibility to submit to that. And you had to carry their equipment for one mile. And so a guy who was in the military you know, carrying all his equipment, he could ask one guy carry it for a mile, then say thank you very much, and then not even say thank you, just say get lost, you know, and then ask another guy, you know, carry my stuff, and just go on without ever carrying his stuff. And what Jesus here is saying, look, when you're asked to go a mile, go two. Go an extra mile, in other words. Don't just go that one mile. What a great opportunity that we will have if we go the extra mile. Can you imagine that soldier knowing that he has a right to ask anyone to walk a mile with him and carry his stuff? There's a certain amount of pride there and control over an individual, right? You have no say in this. You will carry it. But then come at the end of the mile, when you look up at him and say, hey, I'm going to go another mile. And he's going to go, what? What do you mean, go another mile? Yeah, I want to go another mile. Really? Well, I'm not asking you to, and you don't have to. Uh, he's lost control. And now that's that individual who's saying, I want to go an extra mile from my heart. Now he has a certain responsibility, I would think, to listen to this guy and um, get an opportunity, who knows, to share the gospel with him because he's gone the extra mile. Uh, when I remember reading this when I first bought my house here in Mariloma, and I took it literally, I thought, this is a great idea. Going the extra mile with my neighbors. You know, you buy a new house, there's no grass, there's no spring, there's nothing. And so you're trying to beautify your lawn, and so is everyone else. So I told the boys, I said, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to help everybody else in, the, in our neighborhood. Uh, we're going to see them hauling dirt, we're going dig, to dig, dig, we're gonna go over there and help them. And that's what we did. We pretty much went out and helped every one of our neighbors. Didn't ask for help. A lot of them did help us, but we didn't ask for it. We were doing it to go the extra mile. And so a lot of those homes that are around us, we help actually build all their yards and stuff. And now that new people are in there, they don't know that, you know. I could go up there, hey, that wall, I put that wall in for you. You, know, you can thank me later. And those sprinklers over there, I remember when we did 
those sprinklers, you know. I mean, all of them. I mean, there's probably a good 15, 20 homes there that me and the boys were a part of in one way or another. But what I found was I had an opportunity now to minister to them, to witness to them. And, and they couldn't complain because they were helped, right? And it's like, I feel obligated. I need to listen to you now. You know, it's like if I didn't help and I came over and said, hey, I'd like to share with you Jesus. Get out of here, Jesus freak. They could say that, but it's like I come over and I say, I'd like to share Jesus. Oh, wonderful. Okay. You know, because I just helped them move a bunch of dirt you know, and put in sprinklers. And they're like, okay, I'll listen to you. You know, and what's so amazing, because this principle does work when we give more, when we don't just think of our, ourselves and we give our best and go beyond our best, is that God uses it. I can think of at least five families that have come to know the Lord because of uh, that display of love and humility. I remember one family, <clears throat> we, um, we didn't necessarily help them in their yard, just a little bit here and there, but our boys were very active in, in their daughter's lives. And because we were very protective of our boys, they couldn't understand that. And so we had uh, been invited to go over to dinner and, and talk about them. So we went over, and me and Virginia just shared with them Jesus. And, and they had to listen. And, and by the time we were done, we were all on our knees asking Jesus Christ into our hearts. The whole family, the, the mother, the father, and the, and the daughter, and they all asked Christ into their hearts on their knees. And we were just like, we walked home like, what just happened? <laughs> you know, it's like, that's amazing. We go over for dinner, talk about the boys, and we're talking about the Lord, and they get saved. And, and from what I understood, they ended up going to Harvest for quite a long time. And he was on fire witnessing uh, to Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons and, and things like that. And, and many others in, in the community there. Why? Because we, we did more than what was asked of us. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Going the extra mile. Going beyond what is normal. Yeah, we can exist and we can go through life and have an okay life. But I think that when we go beyond that and say, Lord, you created me with a purpose, with a plan to really change things. Wouldn't you like to leave this place, this earth, knowing that you changed even just one individual for good? Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be a purpose and a plan, not just to exist. I digress back to the younger generation. The problem with the younger generation that says they don't need church is they're not really doing anything beyond living life. They're not going the extra mile. They're just existing. There are basically several things that we basically deal with in the flesh, especially in the youth, and that is one. One is selfishness. It's all about self. What can I get? How can I benefit? What is pleasing to me? And nothing else matters. And what Jesus is saying here is, what is not pleasing to the flesh, that you should do. And that is turn the cheek, give your coat, go an extra mile. And that's with anything. That's with anything that we do for the Lord. We don't just exist, but we serve Him with all of our hearts. The other thing is, is they're never involved in the work of God. They're never involved in the plan of God. They're just living their life. Oh, they might be going to school, bettering themselves, hoping to get a degree, hoping to have a good education, raise a family, but that's what everyone else is doing. There's more to life than that. Jesus even said there's more to life than food and, and clothing. There's the work of God that will change a world. And that's what God is talking about here. There was a man, his name was Simon. <clears throat> and he was coming into Jerusalem to offer up his sacrifices during the Passover. And it was when Jesus was carrying his cross up to Golgotha to be crucified. And some of the Roman soldiers saw him walking by and saw that Jesus was having a difficult time carrying the cross. And so they asked Simon, a Cyrian, to carry the cross of Jesus. You remember that story in the Bible? If you saw the movie Passion of the Christ, there's a scene with them asking him to carry the cross. And so they were asking him 
to do his duty, basically, and that was to help Jesus carry his cross to Golgotha. And so they put the cross on him. And of course, Jesus was also carrying that cross with him, which I, I kind of like the picture of being yoked together with Jesus. Do you know who really carried that cross? Jesus did, not Simon. But he got to partake of carrying the cross. I love that because when we partake of the things of God, the plans of God, the works of God, we get blessed. We get blessed. When we have an attitude of arrogance and pride or that we're owed something because in this society, we're owed. Government owes me. My parents owe me. You all owe me. So take care of me. I have a relative that was like that. I didn't ask to be born, so give it up. Come on. Give me the money. Yeah, you didn't ask to be born. I understand that, but go work if you want some money. I'm not going to give it to you. Recently, we had uh, a request, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to fit into the next verse here, <clears throat> from a young lady, and she basically said, I need help. So I responded back, and I said, okay, um, you know, what's going on? Uh, we'll pray for you. And then she responded back, oh, you'll pray for me. Oh, yeah. I've heard that a bunch of times. You Christians like to pray a lot, but you don't like to do anything. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> so I said, okay, so what's your story and how can we help you? She goes, my story is too long to tell you. I don't have the time, but I've been hurt and X with husband on the end, you know, type of thing. And I said, well, how can we help you? She says, well... I need to get out of this situation. I need to live in a good, godly home. And, and I just need to relax and just hopefully heal. So I wrote back. Okay, great. I, I know of some places that we could probably plug you into. You know, give me some time. I'm going up to a men's retreat and I'll get back with you. Oh, no, no that's going to take too long. I don't want you to do that. Uh, you know what? Pray for me. Waste your time. And just start going on. And I'm just like, man, I just can't. I, I wanted to tell her, go find a bottle on the corner of a street somewhere and rub it. And maybe God will give you three wishes. I don't know what you want. You know? I mean, it's like, you are really prideful. I can see why you're in the situation that you're in. I didn't tell her any of that. I'm just thinking this in my head. I mean, you have not humbled yourself before God. I've had people call me and ask for help. And they're really appreciative of the help that we give them. Totally different attitude. Kind of like, can you help me? Well, yeah, we have this ministry and, and we are able to give you some. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate even the little that you can give me. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. I pray that he continues to bless you and use you. I'm like, wow, that's a person that's appreciative, that's humbled by their circumstances. There's a big difference. We have Christians like that in the church. They're very prideful. They come to church like, no, no, no. The church is there to serve me. Really? What did Jesus say? That's what one of the things that this girl kept putting on her, her messages to me. What would Jesus do? Are you asking me? Because I'm going to ask that back to you. What would Jesus do in your case? <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to help you, but oh, you're not letting me. You're so prideful. And there are Christians that come to church that, that way. Come in, I'm, you're to serve me. Jesus said that I didn't come to be served. I didn't come to, uh, to be served, but to serve and to become a ransom for many. So you're here to serve me. I'm like, no, that scripture applies to you too. <laughs> it applies to all of us. We're to serve one another and not have that attitude of, I want to be served. You need to serve me. And I have another thing. I have rights. Really? Does it sound like Jesus is giving us rights here? Turn the other cheek. You know, give your coat away. Does that sound like you've got some rights? It sounds like he's telling you to humble yourself and trust in God. And that God will use this. So Simon is asked to carry the cross. And he carries the cross. He does his duty. And it, it changes his, his whole life. It changes his whole life. It's what I love about service. It's what I love about getting my mind off of myself and putting it on someone else. And it helps me to let things go and let God work those out. And I get to watch other people grow because I'm involved in their lives. It, it, it removes a selfishness out of me. 
And then God does a great work. See, like that person, that's why she's in that position. That's why her marriage is so torn apart, is, is because it's all demands. And you'll never get anywhere like that in life. But if you take the position of humility, and if just one in a relationship humbles himself, they got a chance to survive. But if both, they have a thriving marriage. And if the church understands that, this ministry will thrive, that we're here to serve one another. We're here to serve one another. Not complaining, not grudgingly, but with a joyful heart. Unto the Lord by grace. That carrying of that cross, which could be looked at as a burden to Simon, became grace because it changed his life. Because he just touched God. He was able to see Jesus and how Jesus responded to the whole situation. doesn't say what happened. It's just all supposition. He may have stuck around. He may have heard Jesus' words forgive them. He may have saw lightning and thunder come down when the Father finally removed his spirit from Christ and then he died as he gave up his spirit. That, that may have been the things that he saw, but it changed him because Romans 16.13 talks about his family, Rufus, his son, and how they were chosen of the Lord and how they were effective in the body of Christ. And so that relationship that God created by service and giving up of oneself it changed his whole life and that's why I really believe that the answer to a lot of our problems is that we're not serving we're not giving of ourselves we're just taking 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 and we become anger frustrated that we'd want more and we're focused at self and it destroys us we need to be willing to give up, as Jesus says. So he says in verse 42, there's a fourth example. <clears throat> give to him who asks, who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So another extreme statement. Someone wants to borrow, and the word literally does mean that. If someone wants to borrow at interest, then give it to them. Give it to them. If they ask you for something, give it to them. Uh, it's speaking of someone that might be begging and has a need. And so if you are asked to do something, to give something, then Jesus says, do it. That was his nature, to give, to help, to meet needs. Not to be a miser, but to be a giver. We had a guy that would come here. Uh, he came here t at least twice. He'd ride a bike, and he'd, he first time he told me he was from Ontario, he needed some money. And if we could give him money. So I usually I don't like the church to give money. So I just give them from my own pocket. And I gave him enough money to get back to Ontario. And then about a year later, he comes back again with the same story. And I'm like, Robert, you were here last year. He goes, oh, I was? I'm like, oh. He goes, yeah, here, I'm going to give it to you again. But you've got to stop this. You know, you've got you to gotta work. You've you got to do what's right. You've got to have Jesus in your life. Let him change you. And he's like, yeah, and we never saw him again. So you get those opportunities to witness and to share. And I totally understand that, that sometimes people rip you off. You don't know what they're going to use it for, right? I saw a video of, of some kids. Um, they wanted to see what a, what a homeless person would do if they gave them $100. And so one of the guys went up and said, hey, here's $100. Oh, no, no, I don't want to. Just a few dollars. No, no, here's $100. And the guy got up and hugged him and he was kind of crying. He said, God bless you. So then they stepped back and they were just watching him. He got up and started walking around in the community and went into a liquor store. And there, you can hear him going, oh, okay, we knew it. He's going to go buy alcohol. And they're just kind of filming him. He walks out with you know, bags of gro groceries or they thought alcohol. Goes into where he lives with other homeless people and he starts giving them food. And he's giving everybody food and, you know, and so forth. And so they're like, wow, I can't believe this. This guy literally took the money and helped others. And so they went up to him and said, here's a couple hundred dollars more. They were really impressed by that. That's rare, right? I mean, it, I'm sure it happens. That people have that heart and they, they are out there because of certain reasons. But then you see the videos of this, this uh, elderly lady with gray hair and she's standing on the corner. And, and this video shows this guy who would give money to her every Friday when he got paid. 
And I guess one Friday after giving her money, he had gone around the corner, done something, came back around. He saw her walking back to her Mercedes Benz. So he was angry and went up. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you ripping? What are you talking about? You got a Mercedes. You don't need this money. You don't know what you're talking about. Leave me alone. I'm not giving money to you anymore. I've been giving you five, ten, sometimes twenty dollars. And this is how you live your life. I tell you, lady, if you're on that corner next week, I'm calling the police and I'm going to tear your car apart. I better not see that car here. It's angry. So we have that happen, right? Also. So is Jesus saying that if someone like that asks you for money, do you give it to them? I don't think so. I don't think that's what he's saying. When I started looking up some scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, like Deuteronomy 15, Psalms 112, when he's talking about giving uh, to the poor, he's talking about to the poor who are really poor, who have a need, who are really struggling. That's what he's talking about. And that's what he's talking about here. A person who's asking because they have a legitimate need, we need to help them. But a person that is just trying to fleece the flock, and there's plenty of scriptures that tell us that, that we need to beware of them, then no, you don't help them. You have to use wisdom. Now, I don't just give money. I will go buy food for them. And usually that will be the indicator. Oh, no, no, don't worry about it then. Oh, okay, you wanted it for the alcohol. So there's your answer. Or help them. We have people in the church. Uh, we used to just give them money. And so what we'll do is we'll pay their rent. So we're not giving them anything, but we'll just pay their rent for them where they're staying. Pay where the hotel, where they're paying, uh, staying at, and we'll just pay for it for a couple of days. So just using, using some, some wisdom there. So what is Jesus saying here? In each of these uh, four examples uh, that Jesus gives us, what he is basically saying is go beyond what is normal. If evil is being thrown at you, don't respond by evil actions. Don't retaliate. Go beyond that. And the only way that you can go beyond that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. If they ask you, then give to them if there's a legitimate reason. If they slap you on the face, turn the other cheek. If they ask for your coat, then give them your coat. And give them more even. I remember one guy that we had been taking care of for quite a while and we'd been helping him out. Uh, he had uh, been in trouble, been in and out of jail and the last time he was in jail and we were, Virginia and I would visit him at least once a month, just really encouraging him. And he was just this close to really changing his life. And we invested a lot of time with him. And he ended up staying with us for quite a while. And we even lent him our car to go to work on a regular basis. I mean, just really invested a lot. And then he stabbed us in the back while he was living with us. And so I had to ask him to, to leave. And because of the situation, I, I ended up calling the sheriff saying, could you just be here to, to witness all this? And so they were there, and as he was moving everything out, and it was just, I, I just started laughing when all of a sudden he's talking to the police officer, and he's telling the police officer how bad we are, all the bad things we do. And then, and then at the end, he, he says, oh, and he owes me like $80. He ripped me off $80. I'm like, seriously? Are you, I just started laughing. And, and I'm the type of person is when you accuse me of those things, I'm just like, you know what, I, I know you're wrong, but I just pulled out of my pocket. Here's $80. Is it, was that enough? And he's like, should have asked for more, right? But I gave him the $80, go off, you know, that type of thing. Jesus, that's what Jesus is saying. Go beyond. If, they, if they're asking you, then go beyond what they're asking you. Make an impact. <clears throat> Probably about four or five years later, I get a letter in the mail from him. And he is totally apologizing for all of it. And saying how he now knows that everything we did was for his good. And trying to help him out. Sometimes it takes a while. But if you retaliate with evil. If you don't give in and just give what's normal. You can't make an impact in people's lives. And God wants us to make an impact in people's lives. If you realize that you're not a humble person. Because Jesus is saying some pretty extreme things here. And you might realize, boy, I've got a lot of work to do. Then I'm going to ask you to humble yourself before the Lord. And ask Him to work in your life. Money, material things, they come and go. They're nothing. They're nothing. 
I had a situation that just happened this January where, where my PT blew up and I just put a $4,000 motor in there and the insurance company wouldn't help me. They just says, no, it's totaled. We can't do anything about it. And I know they could have fixed it. It may have cost them four or $5,000, but they could have fixed it. That's not our policy. Sorry. I'm like, you're going to leave me without a vehicle. And I so desperately wanted to retaliate. <laughs> I wanted to put a big 4 by 8 sign on my car, on my other car, and park it right outside of their broker's office. This guy's a crook. <laughs> you know, don't go with him. I, I did so bad. I've seen that done before. And they gave me pennies. And the Lord really had to minister to me, you need to let it go. You need to let it go. Yeah, but that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money I could have had. At least give me what it's really worth. You know, I put $4,000 in the motor and all they gave me was $4,600. I can't buy a car for $600. And so I was really, really upset. But you have to let it go. That's going to come and go. Those things will come and go. And I know when they happen, it's really difficult and hard to deal with those type of situations, but it comes and go. Money comes and it goes. As the scripture says, it seems like you put it in your pocket and your pockets have holes and it's like when you reach in, it's gone. Where did it go? Because it just comes and goes. So make sure it's going with some heavenly value, right? And it's going for the glory of God because it's going to go. I don't know how many times I wished, I wished, God would have allowed me to give it away instead of something breaking down and me having to fix it, you know? Man, Lord, if you would have just told me, you know, and not break my car down, I could have taken it and given it to someone. I'd rather have done that. I have to pour it into my vehicle, right? It comes and goes, and so we can't hang on to it too tightly. We need to humble ourselves.